Notice as well how intense some of the plane changes are currently. You can see that particularly well here. This is on purpose and it's done so that it's well understood where the two planes meet. Being subtle about plane changes early on has the same effect as going for a subtle version of the gesture on a figure early on. A subtle gesture established early on is unlikely going to survive the addition of clay needed in order for that figure to appear as full and as wide as it will eventually need to be. Therefore, a little bit more gesture compared to a little bit less in the beginning is better. I find that the same thing is true when it comes to the forms sitting inside the contours, which we often call the internal information. A little more early on is better since it will be buried under clay that we'll use to make the surface and the transitions later. I'm always more worried about things being too subtle in the beginning and I'd like to have a clear view of everything that I've done and found, even though a lot of it will become very hard to see later on towards the end of, uh, of the sculpture, because it gets buried under clay and made more subtle. But I like to see it early on. Small point I want to make here, which is actually hugely important in my opinion. Notice that I'm building the width of everything together. I'm not only working at the tip of the nose, I'm working a bit all over the place. So not only do you want to bring out the widths symmetrically from the center line out, you want to build the widths out while maintaining the relationship the widths have between each other. This is going to be the same in portraits and in figures for the most part. You don't want to sacrifice the relationship widths have to each other while building them out because that makes your piece look very abstract in relationship to the subject, to your reference. Which doesn't help you one bit when it comes to comparing the two against each other. We want to make that comparison as easy as possible to make and the best way to do so is to make sure that the widths are built in relationship to each other, the same relationship that we find on our reference. As you know, I'm a big proponent of keeping an active centerline on your work throughout the entire process. Partially, this is also something I find useful because of my approach. Working with smaller amounts of information while the piece is growing and becoming wider means that it can easily become asymmetrical or things can be built into the wrong places or shift spots, let's say. So a centerline just keeps me honest. It seems like a beginner's trick, if you will, that you shouldn't need to do once you get more experience, but I can assure you that I still use one to this day, both in my portraits and in my figures, and I know most of my colleagues do as well. I find it tremendously useful, and it's such a cheap and easy trick, so why wouldn't you use it? If you look at parts of the nose currently, especially along the center line at the bridge of the nose, the surface is starting to become consolidated, meaning it's brought together into one instead of a bunch of clay dots. This is a natural part of the process for me since I tend to want a smooth surface. Which actually won't be that smooth by the way, but a surface that will appear smooth, somewhat smooth, when observed from a distance. You might not want that, and if you don't, you can skip steps like this. But for me, it's a natural part of the process. And you do want to follow your nose here, I think. Or your gut, if you will. Do what feels natural and make what you are naturally attracted to, not what everybody else wants to see.
Consolidating the surface starts with making sure that some of the holes are filled. There are a lot of gaps between the pieces of clay that I have added, and I add clay into those gaps to make sure that they're filled. A common solution at this point would be to rake away at the surface, but I find that it can cause a lot of issues, and you can rake through your established volumes, flattening out the sculpture. Start by making sure that the surface is not full of holes before raking, and you'll be better off. Never rake through negative holes in the surface, always fill them in with clay and then rake over them again if you are going to use the rake. This will help you avoid raking through your volumes and making flat work. Up to this point, we've almost only used our hands to add clay and a drawing tool to draw on the surface with. So as you can see, you don't need too many tools or any fancy tools, frankly, to do this type of work. Of course, if this was a smaller scale, like life-size, because this nose is about twice life-size, then your hands and fingers might be too big to add some of the more delicate information. While a little bit like saying, always paint with the largest brush possible, which isn't necessarily true, by the way, I will say that trying to do as much work as you can with your hands can speed up the process and get you to a decent place a bit faster. Though, of course, there does come a point where tools are needed because the work is too delicate to be done with your big, ugly hands. It's not a hard and fast rule, by the way. I do know several great, great sculptors who do not abide by a rule like this and rarely use their hands, mostly use tools. However, I find it's helpful for me and it keeps me from getting too detailed when the work that needs to be done it's not so detailed, perhaps. Keeps me dealing with the broader strokes versus getting into too intricate of details. And it also keeps me away from trying to make the surface nice or whatever. The plane changes are becoming softer, as you can see. And if we've done a good job setting things up for ourselves, this will happen when you add clay in between your planes. Without much effort or and without much work. Remember that a lot of this has to do with strategy. For example, certain planes or form turns, like how the bridge of the nose turns down to the side plane of the nose, cannot happen unless the clay is added in the right place way before we get to the place in the process that we find ourselves here and now. If the side planes of the nose weren't wide enough and coming out from the bridge of the nose at the correct angle, they would never blend softly into the front plane of the face because the transition is partially predicated on how the two planes meet, at what angle they meet. If the two planes meet at an angle that's too abrupt, no amount of clay is going to allow that transition, transition to become soft and similar to how we see it on our model. This all starts with good drawing. If your profile isn't well dealt with, and the relationship between the heights and the depths aren't well drawn and dealt with properly, you cannot get a good result once you get to this point in the process. Forms won't transition naturally into one another because they are simply not sitting in natural places and at natural planes. This is why I talk so much about drawing and going back to drawing all the time. Without good drawing, the work falls apart, and the further into the process you get, the worse it will get, and the harder drawing will become to deal with and fix. Which is why I try so hard in the beginning to deal with it, to deal with drawing really, really well, or to the best of my ability at least. Strategy plays a big role here. It's a strategic move to slowly build up the wits. It's a strategic move to go back to the side view while still missing a lot of widths. And these moves force me to deal with the drawing and to not get sucked into trying to do something else which won't benefit the work later on.
That's it for today's video. Thank you for watching until the end. I hope you learned a thing or two that you can take with you into your own practice. Until next time, stay creative.